This podcast does not provide medical advice. Please listen to the complete disclosure at the end of the recording. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Everyone Dies, the podcast. I'm Marianne Matzo. And I'm Charlie looking for my lost shaker of salt. Haven't you been looking for that, like, for weeks now? No. Um, it was uh, summer when it was warmer. So now I'm in a very toasty room. I am imagining Margaritaville, you know, Jimmy Buffett, the whole nine yards. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's kind of toasty here. So put on your comfy PJs, okay. and fuzzy socks, All right. grab an adult beverage mm-hmm. or six or eight or whatever it is you need. Relax and thank you for spending the next hour with us as Charlie gets a little culture in our first half. In our second half, mm-hmm. we're going to be talking about factors influencing decisions at the end of life. And in our third half, we're going to be drinking with death. Cheers. So, Charlie, we are in... Uh, salut. So, Charlie, we are in the merriest of seasons, the holiday season. Bah. We're all as merry and bright. What is the holiday season without daily sugar crashes and stomach aches? If for some reason you want to avoid these, Charlie's going to report on the worst offenders of the sugar blues. Charles? Here are some of the unhealthiest holiday foods on the planet that just so happen to be all desserts. Be a little mindful this season and enjoy in moderation to avoid using the Twinkie defense for your misdeeds. Let's take a look at, look at, at this list, shall we? Pecan yes, uh, let's. pie. Marianne, is that pecan or pecan? Depends on where you're from. So there are some that say pecan mm-hmm. are those little round green things uh-huh. in a can. Yeah. You know, pecan. Mm-hmm. Um, where, I don't know, I always said pecan. I did too, because, you, that, you, you know, I, grew, I you know, was born in like, you know, the southern part of Detroit. So I, I guess that's more like southern. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I was oh, south Detroit, Detroit too. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so. Uh, pecan pie. That's why we're so tough. Yes, exactly. Uh, pecan pie. Um, you know, pecan, you know, I've never been a fan, fan of pecan pie. So let's move on to fruitcake. Fruitcake, uh, <laughs> fruitcake. Well, let's not, I don't want to discuss my cousin. Uh, fudge, uh, f- ooh, fudge. Have you ever had fudge from, uh, upstate New York, Mackinac Island? Mackinac Island is not in upstate New York. Did I say, oh, I did say upstate New York. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was saying it for everyone was paying attention. I uh, look forward to everyone pointing that out in your messages. Thank you. Well, I'm pointing it out. The fudgies on Mackinac Island. Yes. Do you ever make fudge? Um, you know, oh, wait a minute. Yes, it was. Wait a minute. What was the circumstances? I was not alone. Hmm. <laughs> 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 No, I said no. Oh, I don't know. I, is this going to be a good story I, or a story I, that I need what? to hum going, and not I'm, listen to? I'm thinking <laughs> it happened sometime in the 80s. <laughs> oh, God. Wow, this is getting yeah. Worse and worse. Huh, yeah, you know, I don't. I, I don't. Were there, were there drugs and alcohol involved? Um, probably alcohol. I can't imagine drugs, no. Um, I just don't remember. It's, uh, it's, well. uh, it's a little foggy. Okay. So yeah. if there's anybody out there who was with nope. Charlie on the sponge making. Do not, do not, <laughs> do, do not. We want a full report do not of Charlie's, do not Charlie's fudge. Collect $200, please. <laughs> and uh, then uh, a Yule log, I guess this is one of these things, I guess we just thrown to the fire. Okay, so we're done with the desserts. Oh, just kidding. Let's go back. Let's start at, back at the top again. So pecan or pecan. Pie. So, pecans are a great source oh. of uh, plant-based protein, fiber, and manganese. Is that like that Philip manganese when people take when their tummies hurt? You mean like milk of magnesia? Yeah, milk of yeah. manganese. That's what it is. Thank you. So, uh, <laughs> plant-based protein, fiber, and uh, manganese. Suspend them. Suspend them, really? Like um, Houdini or David Copperfield? Or off your tree. Uh, oh, yes, of course. So, suspend them in sugary syrup held in place with a battery. Oh, no, that's buttery. I guess there might be a typo. Uh, held in place with a buttery, flaky... No, what? it says buttery because there's a U in it. It says U. Uh, <laughs> with a buttery, flaky pie crust 
though, and uh, health benefits are quickly overshadowed. A traditional pecan yeah. pie can contain around 500 calories per slice. And when you add the Imagine. necessary vanilla ice cream, mm, you're looking at about 700 calories for this dessert alone. When it's not but our one look, piece with, with, of this dessert. With what? It's crazy. With what? For one piece, 700 calories for one So you might as well go the whole hog and find like a little miniature uh, pecan pie. And, and You mean like the kind that you get in the store for like a dollar? Oh, oh no. Uh, no, 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 no. No, no, you have to go to a real bakery, not... Oh, no. I thought you were talking about those little hostess pies. Oh, no. 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 I forgot what I was talking about. Anyway, so, um, oh, yeah. So this, yeah. Well, yeah. Listen, just, you know, one slice alone, one of these bad boys is like 700 calories. Uh, but you know what? When there's when it's not a la mode, there's also about 30 grams of sugar and 19 grams of fat. So if you're keeping count, <laughs> it really why why would you why why torture yourself? All right. Well, these these are the worst things. So there you have yes. it. The worst pecan pie. So moving on with continuing the worst cal- category, fruit cake. What's in a fruit cake exactly? Yeah, let's not go there. Well, this dense cake is packed <laughs> with, with dried or candied fruit and nuts and is often soaked in alcohol. Okay, you may, folks, for, for those of you uh, keeping track at home, you may want to highlight this part. So we'll take a moment to go find your highlighter. Let's repeat this. It's often soaked in alcohol, even sans alcohol. And why really would you make a fruitcake sans alcohol? Why would you make fruitcake at all? Well, uh, well, okay, if you need a doorstop uh, and you want to give a doorstop as a holiday treat, there you are. Okay. There you are. So without alcohol, this cake might sound healthy, but it is still actually incredibly high in sugar. Each slice ranges anywhere from 300 to 500 calories and about 22 to 50 grams of sugar. God. Oh, and you know, and this is surprising, which is much higher than the American Heart Association <laughs> recommended. <laughs> 50 to 36 grams per day. And then you take that fruit cake and you toast it and load it with butter. You know, I you might as well and, just and, 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 and you know, know what? And I and I, I thought, wait a minute, but there is something good about it. And I forgot that exactly. Lightly toasted, mm-hmm. a little melted butter, and, and really think about it. Anything lightly toasted or with a little uh, warm butter, you, you just never go wrong. Well, a lot of butter is even better than a little butter. But you know what? If you have and, – and last night, uh, speaking of that, I accidentally uh, put – and you know, and I, I love butter. Uh, what even I felt was too much butter on in a bowl of popcorn. Because I think was it swimming? Yeah, and you see, it just there's a certain point of saturation or a saturation point. Um, mm-hmm. However, it's pronounced the um, yeah. Or, or what? what you do then is you go pop more but more popcorn because you've got all that butter already melted. But I was just so comfy in front of the TV, watching an old movie, sipping the old uh, G and T. Um, yeah, I just didn't want to get up again. So, yeah. Yeah. So tell us about your fudge experience. Okay, so let's go down to Yule Log. Um, <laughs> this is a family show, so... Oh, your family's what fudge recipe. <laughs> so, what is it, Charlie? Uh, listen, uh, so, you know, listen, fudge recipes, family fudge recipes are often uh, difficult to resist, and primarily because they're packed with sugar. Um, and butter. Well, yeah, sugar and butter. Butter and sugar, sugar and butter. Da, 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 da. Okay. I think it's horse and carriage, isn't it? Um, no, not horse and carriage. That'd be sugar and butter. And you really can't put a horse and carriage in fudge. So, okay. Um, because most fudge is made with uh, sugar and butter. Um, and if it's not made, then, you know, with sugar and butter, then... Um, I don't know, just something 
wrong with that. So uh, most fudge is made with sugar, butter, and of course milk. Um, but you can also use, some folks use uh, sweetened condensed milk, which means it's a dessert option that is high in calories, fats, and sugars. Each one-inch cube of fudge has about 90 calories and 16 grams of sugar. You know, and you just hold that under your tongue and slip right into a coma. Um, okay, something to put on my wish list. Okay, good. So, you know, since we're talking about medical aid and dying and that kind of thing, this week, you know, any of these would help you... Reach, reach nirvana, yes. <laughs> yes. And, and the nice thing between, uh, um, well, I don't know if it's, it's, it's a nice thing, but, uh, uh, you know, it's just an injustice. It's just a thing. It's a thing. Well, it's an injustice of, of, of justice. Fudge is, is available in all 50 states. Medical assistance in dying is not. We should, we will discuss that uh, when, uh, when we get to, to that. <laughs> <laughs> when we get to the second. It's going to be an interesting. So interesting hold on. Second half. So hold on. Last but and certainly least, I mean not least, Yule log. Nothing screams. Have you ever had a Yule log? I have never had a Yule log. My mother never made a Yule log. Did yours? Um, I've seen movies with Yule Brenner, and uh, I've logged in many hours. At uh, um, can I mention uh, Gallagher's in Manhattan? Whoops! I just did. So, uh, so there we are. So, in 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 the periphery, yes, I have. What's it? What's at Gallagher's? <gasps> oh, this is great. So you reach Gallagher's. It's a steakhouse. It's been around since 1927. It was. Oh wait, did I go there? You, I went there. They have like multi levels of. There, it's huge, and there's like some. Places where you sit that like are a little bit higher than other places. Is that Gallagher? No, that sounds like a Fridays at Las Vegas in Las Vegas. No, uh, Ga- <laughs> I make myself laugh. You're such a jerk. I know. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll be here all week. Dip, dip, dip your dip your server as well. The um, no, uh, no, this bad boy uh, opened in 1927. It, it does have a second floor, and during Prohibition. Um, you would walk up to the second floor, you know, nice little charming, still all the original old, uh, woodwork and everything. And then there's a wall. <laughs> yeah. Right. Behind that wall was the real parties. It was just, you know, one of the big speakeasies back during prohibition. Uh, but Gallagher's what it had, and, and really everyone, I mean, most of the, <sighs> Every big person from, you know, uh, you know, this is the heart of Broadway. So, you know, musicians, actors, dancers, politicians, movie stars, millionaires, billionaires, and humble folk such as myself. Um, yeah, this, if these walls could talk. Gallagher's, I don't, I don't know, 20 years ago, something like that, I forget, 30 years ago, took out the front wall uh, on the sidewalk installed a plate glass so people walk by you can look in that window and look at what steak you want it's really cool it's a it's a it's a freezer uh, and people walk by and just yeah it's what does this cool. have to do with the u log um hmm I, need, <laughs> I thought you were saying they, they put in a plate glass and you could see you logs oh, no. and all the desserts. No, I just mentioned uh, Gallagher's because I've logged in a lot of hours at Gallagher's and you asked, have you been there? And then you asked me well, about what it. What does it have to do with you? Um, that uh, Yule Brenner movies and I've logged in a lot of hours. at So, so yes, I am associated with Yule Log, uh, uh, acquainted with Yule Log. Okay, so moving on. Nothing. <laughs> and no, so uh, a traditional U log, I don't believe so. I've, I have not had one of these bad boys. All right. Yes. So I don't know how it's like such a thing if neither you nor I have ever had one. Yeah, you know, one. given a population of 330 million people in this country, uh, yeah, if you, if you and I have one, we are trendsetters. Right, because we, we're we a are, couple of we're, swells. We're, Da, 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 yes, da, exactly. Da, da. Yes, exactly. I mean, we've been we've been all over the world and all over. And if we've never seen a U log, then how popular could it 
heck and be. Um, I said heck for Sandy. That, that's Thank that's, you, that's, Sandy. that's very noble of you. Okay. So anyway, so the Yule Law Cake is a buttery cream swirl that runs through the center of it of a log-shaped chocolate cake all slathered in chocolate icing. You know, this is beginning to sound uh, pretty good, though. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you here. Along with any additional sugary decorations. Well, of course. While the nutritional makeup varies depending on the recipes, each slice of this festive wintry cake is high caloric and as high as you can imagine, loaded up with fat and sugar. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Well, I'm all for fat and sugar. I mean, they're some of my best friends. Please check out the webpage link for more high-calorie food suggestions at Christmas food suggestions, Christmas holiday thingy suggestions. We're talking about cakes. Um, High-caloric Christmas food and suggestions for substitutions. Because if you don't want to get fat and high on sugar, there's other things you can eat. Don't ask us what they yeah, are. Yeah, I have really have no clue. But you can go, go to the go web page and, and find it. And, you know, forget Google. Are. Go to the web page. Yeah, because because we don't know the answer, but it's exactly because that's just that's how we work. Exactly. So to do that, please go to everyonedies.org. That's every the number one dies org, and send us your own recipes to share with others, or or maybe we won't. If it's something that just sounds great, we may just keep it for ourselves. Also, we appreciate your questions and anything else you want to tell us. You can email us at mail at everyonedies.org. Remember the number one, please. Please join our Facebook group, Everyone Dies. And Everyone Dies is spelled out. So our Facebook group, Everyone Dies. And please remember to rate and review this podcast. Molly, our fantabulous light dancer Twitter two-shoes. Whew is hoping you contribute to make everything right in her world by following us on Twitter and reposting her tweets. Really, guys, you need to step up. She needs you. Step up. So, Charlie, I'm told that you are going to recite a bit of Shakespeare to lead us into our second half. Oh, did I did I miss a meeting or something? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. I'm, re- I'm ready. Yes. Because whenever you don't show up at a meeting, we give you weird things to do. (laughs) Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, yes. Hamlet's soliloquy. Actually, the famous one. So, when we last left off Hamlet, we we saw that Polonius and Claudius were hiding and eavesdropping. So, Polonius is the father of Hamlet's sometime girlfriend, Ophelia. And Claudius is... Yeah, okay. So the thread is this. Claudius is Hamlet's stepfather. Hamlet's father has died. Or maybe he was killed. And maybe Claudius had something to do with it. So his uncle has now married his mother. Do the math. Look up your uh, your Freud. So Hamlet's in a bit of a quandary, but he really suspects his father. I mean, sorry, his stepfather. So, while Polonius and Claudius hide an eavesdrop, Hamlet breaks into his most famous soliloquy, which is probably the best speech, uh, the best known speech in the English language. Probably right up there with, I don't want her, you can have her, she's too fat for me. So it's between one of, one of those two. <laughs> or Shapoopy. Shapoopy? Mm-hmm. From the Music Man. Shapoopy. Oh, yes. No, I, I think I, I no, I think I don't want her. You can have her. She's too fat for me. Is uh, probably above it. So, um, but yeah. Apart from that, probably the best known speech in the English language. Um, Hamlet returns to the question of suicide, wondering if it would be preferable to end his life or not. To be or not to be. That is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing end them. To say we end the... Uh, Charlie, Charlie. Yeah? What about a a, a more modern English translation of Hamlet's soliloquy so that us kids from Detroit can 
have any chance of understanding it. Wait, wait. I mean, yes, of course. The uh, um, so basically to live or to die. That is the question. Is it nobler to suffer through all the terrible things fate throws at you or to fight off your troubles and in doing so, end them completely? To die, to sleep, because that's all dying is. And by a sleep, I mean an end to all the heartache and the thousand injuries that we are vulnerable to. That's an end to be wished for. To die, to sleep. To sleep, perhaps a dream. Yeah, but there's there's the catch. Because the kinds of dreams that might come in that sleep of death, after you have left behind your mortal body, are something to make you anxious. That's the consideration that makes us suffer the calamities of life for so long. Because who would bear all the trials and tribulations of time, the, the oppression of the powerful, the insults from arrogant men, the pangs of unrequited love, the slowness of justice, the disrespect of people in office, and the general abuse of good people by bad, when you could just settle all your debts using nothing more than a, than a dagger? Who would bear his burdens and grunt and sweat through a tiring life if they weren't they weren't frightened of what might happen after death, that undiscovered country from which no visitor returns, which we wonder about and makes us prefer the troubles we know rather than fly off to face the ones we don't. Mm. Thus the fear of death makes us all cowards, and our natural willingness to act is made weak by too much thinking. Actions of great urgency and importance get thrown off course because of this sort of thinking, and they cease to be actions at all. Hello, and welcome to our second half. Does my voice sound different? Apparently, we were having technical issues during our first half, and so um, I'm re-recording, so we don't have Charlie here and his comments, but I wanted to make sure that you could hear what uh, we wanted to say regarding the issue of um, is there such a thing as a life that's not worth living? Uh, Charlie just did the the scene um, from um, Hamlet where he's asked, being Hamlet's asking, you know, is it should I live or or should I die? And these are no longer the musings of a solitary troubled prince. It really represents an authentic moral dilemma f- for reasonable people. There are many factors that are involved when a person makes a decision regarding whether or not to be or not to be. So today I'm going to explore with you one factor, one such factor, which is religion, which honestly is a frequent consideration in this decision-making process. Uh, People may be suffering with an illness. People may feel that life just isn't worth living anymore, but... Oftentimes, the thing that keeps them from making a decision to prematurely end their life are their either religious convictions or their fear about will they be punished in the next life. Uh, So religion should be seen as a different concept from religiosity and from spirituality. Those, these are three different things. Typically when, you know, I meet a new person or admitting a person, um, I ask if they belong to a particular religion. A lot of times, though, we don't take that next step and ask, uh, what does that religion mean to them? Does it mean anything to them? And how they express their religion. You really can't um, say, oh, so you're a Catholic, so I know exactly what that means. You really have to ask the person, so what does that mean to you? I had a friend who was um, East Indian, um, was a Hindu, but had spent her formative years and raised in a Jewish home in Chicago. And if you were to say to her, what is your religion? She would say, you know, that, that you know, she, she was Hindu, but... Um, she had a dog named, two dogs that were named Nemus and Marcus. Um, she celebrated Hanukkah. She, you couldn't tell 
based on her Eastern Indian roots, what, how she expressed herself spiritually. So um, religion, just give you a couple of uh, concepts here. Religion is um, the recognition on the part of a person of a controlling superhuman power that's entitled to obedience, reverence, and worship. It's that belief in a higher power. Religiosity, on the other hand, is the quality of being religious, our piety, our devoutedness. Um, knowledge of a, re- of a religion does not inform us about someone's religiosity. So what do these concepts have to do about end-of-life decisions? Well, they're factors that caregivers and patients take into account when they're making decisions. The term euthanasia is associated with the act of mercifully ending the life of a hopelessly suffering patient. But why are we talking about it now? Why in, you know, you know, the 2020s are we saying, gee, you know, there are people that are going to want to end their life? Well, the world, the, the medical world is different than it was in the 1900s, um, we now know that technology can save life, it can prolong life, it can cure disease, but we also know that it can be used inappropriately and at a high price. People can be victims of the technology. Yeah, we can put, you know, we can resuscitate somebody and put them on a ventilator, but that doesn't mean that they're ever going to walk out of the hospital. They can lay and be on that ventilator until some other organ goes wrong. And in the past, people would go to other, you know, facilities, nursing homes, where they would languish on that ventilator, on a feeding tube, using all of the technology that we have for sometimes years. Until we began to ask the question, is that what you want? Some people will say yes, but there will be people who will say, no, I don't want that, and actually have their advanced directive that says, I don't want that, so that we can release them from the technology and allow death to happen naturally. So dying can be extended beyond really what is reasonable. And if we don't make our wishes known, if we don't have some discussions with our loved ones ahead of time, that can happen. We also see a loss of faith in medicine. We're afraid of life extended artificially, that we will not be taken seriously as persons, that our rights will be slighted, and that medicine will do things to us that violate our meaning of life, that someone else will control us. And control has been a big issue in the 2020s, hasn't it? Where You're not going to make me do something that I don't want to do. And we need to take that seriously. Technology in all of its forms has two sides to it. It's a double-edged sword. It It can fix things, but it can hurt things. We also fear what medicine can't cure. This includes mental deterioration, like, you know, the the different types of, of dementia, the wasting away of our bodies, embarrassment of disfigurement, uh, sapping of our energy, the loss of control and the ability to do things for ourselves, physical pain and psychological anguish. These are things that can go along with long-term diseases that are terminal, that don't have a cure, they can continue to, to go and, and waste ourselves away until we actually die. And some people look at that option with certain diseases in particular where they say, I know the course of this illness. I know there is no cure. I don't want to go down the road. And what we wrestle with as a society is, is that their decision to make. Do we support that? And how do we support that? Also, people are living longer. And with this can come physical and mental decline. Elders fear, typically fear, going to a nursing home. Now, my experience has been if they've been declining and living alone, that often when they get to the nursing home, they say, 
I feel safer. I feel better. I have people around me. Somebody's giving me food, and I don't have to worry about my leaky roof. But it's the idea of going to the nursing home that, again, that, that I, have, I have my rights. I want to make my own decisions. I don't want to leave my own home. That drives that. For all of these reasons, there are people who believe that euthanasia can do what medicine cannot. So there's this emphasis in our society on autonomy, the right to choose for oneself. That's what autonomy means. Auto means, you know, to do it yourself. Euthanasia is, can be considered the ultimate choice. It gives the person a say in when and how one is going to die. It provides individual control over dying. Underlying all of this rhetoric, though, are about rights of choice. And it's really concern about control. Often the fear at the end of life is the fear of the loss of control. This raises philosophical and theological questions. Do we really have complete control over our lives? Do our lives really belong to us? Does autonomy extend to actively ending one's life? These are questions within religion and within law and within families and within our own moral code that we wrestle with. At the root of these questions, though, are questions about meaning. The meaning of our rights. What do we have a right to? Do we have a right only to ourselves and only to what it is that we want to do? Or do we have a right to society? Do we have a right to to, to um, be taking care of other people? Um, it's, what are the meanings of autonomy? Or the, relate, the relatedness of others and how we relate to God. When one searches for meaning relative to the end of life, more questions have to be answered. These questions are, what does life mean for a human being? You know, we wrestle with that regarding issues of abortion. When does life begin? But also, at the end of life, when is life over? You know, we've defined it within medicine as saying if there's no active brain waves, that they, a person can be considered medically or legally dead and their heart can still be beating and their, their lungs can still be breathing. Can human life be equated with mere biological function? The fact that your heart is being beating, does that mean that you are still alive? Um, we can cease being a human person while still, in some sense, being alive. So if somebody has, um, you know, a major stroke where, you know, their, their brain stem is irreparably damaged or, you know, an accident where that has happened and the heart is still beating, is that person still there? There's no brain waves. They can't talk. They can't say what they want. They can't make a decision or order a pizza. There's nothing that is a part of them that is still alive. But are they still a person? What meaning do we give to dependency on others, to decline and aging and to pain and suffering, to illness and death, to human existence as a whole? You know, the, the part of this whole issue is, well... They're not her anymore. They're not him anymore. They, they can't communicate. They can't do the things that they want. They're just a body in a bed. But is that body in a bed still a human being that should be kept alive at all costs? These are the questions that we, that we wrestle with. Some claim that we're experiencing a crisis about the meaning of life and that euthanasia is seen as an effective remedy for dealing with some of life's uh, negativities. Weakening in some fundamental religious beliefs, especially those having to do with the existence of God or the relationship of God to human beings and of human beings to God or an afterlife, can contribute to the support of euthanasia. If there is no God 
then one's life is seen as a gift of the creator built entirely as something that is our own. We don't have a responsibility to a higher power if this is our belief system. Religiosity based injunctions against against taking innocent human life then uses its force. You know, it's it's said in the Bible that we're created in God's image, and therefore, because we're created in God's image, if we kill ourselves or kill another human being, we are de facto killing God. And so if this is the belief system that we hold on to individually or as a society, then what happens at the end of life, what happens when that brainstem is no longer functioning, takes on a different meaning. People often say to me, you know, look at, look at my mom. She's laying there. She can't do anything. She can't respond to me. If she were my dog, I would just take her to the vet and have her put down. But the thing is, it's not a dog. And it's a different view. It's a different perception of how we treat animals as opposed to how we treat people. And in reality, a lot of times, I I sometimes wonder about dogs who are treated far better than some children in our society. But that's like a whole other story. We, We don't treat everybody equally, and we don't treat animals and people equally. But still, there's this religious idea of if we're created in God's image, you know, you can't take that life. There's also the issue if there is no afterlife, you don't have to worry about ultimate accountability uh, for engaging in euthanasia. If you don't believe that there's anything after, after here, then you don't have to worry about heaven and hell or purgatory or any way that you're going to be punished for the decisions that you make. If you don't believe in reincarnation, you don't have to worry about, you know, coming back in a less... Um, form because you have lived a poor, uh, made poor decisions in your life or actively ended your life. Even for people who are religious with a high degree of religiosity, they believe that ending a life under certain circumstances are acceptable. Euthanasia is seen as a legitimate exercise of human intelligence and choice. The moral evil seen in other types of killing is not associated with euthanasia. So when you're looking at this issue of is a life worth living, is your life worth living, there are a lot of considerations. And I, part of my belief in, in why I got into um, the practice of palliative care is that if people's souls are not in anguish and if their pain is managed and if they're well cared for at the end of life, then there isn't really a need, you know, air quote the need, to prematurely end the life. Life is very precious and we can be pretty cavalier about it when we're healthy and when we're young and when we can still run around and do anything. You know, how many times do you hear people say, oh God, if I ever get like that, just, you know, take me out in the backfield and shoot me. Except when they get to the point where they're quote unquote like that, they no longer want to go out in the backfield and, sh- and be shot. They want to fight for every minute of their life. I've seen this over and over again. I've seen people with, you know, stage four lung cancer have been heavy smokers since they were 12. And they'll say, you know, I I wish I'd known this was how it was going to end. I wouldn't have smoked for the last 60 years. And you can you can take that any any way you want. But the point is, is that when they get to that period, when as human beings, we get to that period where we were so sick and we're facing and looking at death in the eye and we're saying, yeah, I know I can't go to the bathroom by myself, but I still don't want to leave this earth. You know, the question becomes, is your pain managed? Are, are you treated with dignity? Are, are there some joys in your life? And those are the things 
that palliative care can offer so that you don't have to suffer at the end of life. There's no reason to suffer. Palliative care, good palliative care, can ensure that that doesn't happen. You don't have to prematurely end your life if you're having that good end-of-life care. So um, thank you for listening to this, and we'll go back to um, Charlie and our third half. Here we go. So welcome to the third half of Everyone Dies. It's my pleasure once again to be drinking with death. Death, how are you? Oh, I am. Uh, I'm good. I, I am good. I've been very busy since we last spoke, but I am very, very good. You know, last time we were chatting, I said I wanted to talk with you about death and the coronavirus. Mm. And um, I did a, a podcast about how you die from the coronavirus. And I was wondering... Is there any insights? How you how have you been feeling? How are you holding up? You seem like you should be like pretty darn busy all over the world. Yeah, I have been busy all over the world. And I will tell you, I have seen people who have been very fortunate and had mild cases. And I would stop by and I would see they didn't even have to go in the hospital. So I would leave them um, on their own. But in some of the hospitals, people who cannot breathe, that, that must be terrifying and horrifying. And I was in a person's home and um, she could not catch her breath. They didn't take her to the hospital. I don't know why. It was quite early on. Apparently, uh, I believe it was in Boston, there had been some kind of a convention or something that she had gone to and and she could not breathe and that was before they had the um uh, the masks and and the various things so um you know i went back to check on the rest of her family and um the husband also got it but the the children were were not ill but seeing the people I'll tell you what bothers me the most, seeing yeah, the, peop the people who, um, who are trying to help them, mm -hmm. that bothers me the most because they are brave, brave people and they are working under the worst conditions. It is just so sad. And that's not just in this country, it's all over. When they say pandemic, they're not kidding. They're not kidding. It is everywhere. And uh, sometimes when I'm out and I see people who aren't paying attention and who gather and are, are playing uh, soccer and golf uh, and, and all of those things, I, I, you know, I wonder where is their brain? Where is their brain? So I get, um, I don't get angry very often, but I want to say I have enough work to do. I don't need to do more work because of your stupidity. I know that's not nice, but that's, that's the way I feel about it. Yeah. Are you ever able to communicate that with people? Like take them to like a near death experience to kind of wake them up? I wish I could. I wish I could. But you know, there is enough on the news, on television, and um, on um, uh, various uh, machines, computers and the like, Oh, my goodness, what did people do before computers and those silly cell phones things? Um, you know, I'm back. <laughs> I go back uh, to smoke signals. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. Um, but, you know, throughout my my history, um, it's understandable if they don't have the means and the know-how to cure a disease and people work on it. But these days, with the sheer stupidity of some people, it is just pathetic that I'm taking people before is really their time and there's nothing I can do about it. 
How does this pandemic compare to what you went through in like 1918 or any of the other um, plagues or mm. epidemics that you've experienced? <laughs> oh, plagues. Uh, you mean the one in Egypt with the frogs? <laughs> I enjoyed that. Uh, <laughs> oh, listen, honey, it's just because I'm having my kamikaze again. <laughs> and you remember what I told you about uh, laughing. That doesn't take away the seriousness of life, but laughing, you know, that's all right. Um, that's right. The, pan <laughs> the pandemic... Um, with the flu in 1918, that was very, very, very bad because they did not have the, the medical knowledge then um, to, uh, to help people. But now they don't have the medical knowledge, but they have um, countries all over are trying to find something. Um, they did have some preventative measures of people getting sick from it. I know that for a fact. Um, and those weren't uh, put into place. Uh, but um, it angers me that people uh, are blaming uh, the, the Chinese in America uh, and, and getting mad at them. It's not their fault. Uh, it's just, it's just a terrible, terrible situation. I think there is more anger and hatred uh, in this pandemic than I have seen before in other terrible uh, um, uh, epidemics and pandemics. I, I uh, yeah, there, there is a lot more um, uh, stupidity and anger and hate. That's what I see. How do you count for that? I mean, do you have any insight since you've been able to see these things over centuries? Well, you don't want me to get into uh, um, um, mm -hmm, uh, uh, political um, uh, things, do you? Um, because uh, in various countries, um, um, things are looked at um, differently, and certainly in this country, um, there are things that uh, might not be appropriate on the setting for me to say, uh, mm -hmm. unless you want me to, of course. But, uh, you know, there are countries that things are quite backward uh, in this country, well, forgive me for saying, but uh, certain people are quite backward uh, at the top. So um, that angers me. That angers me that lives have been lost and will be lost because of um, egos and unpleasantness. Mm -hmm. that, must, that must make your, your work even more difficult. It does. It does. Because there are people who are dying before their time, and I can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Kind of can't keep people from their own um, self-destruction sometimes, can you? Well, um, no, no. Um, but there are people who uh, had... Um, like the medical people who are working and the people who are patients uh, uh, in places where they cannot leave and they're getting ill and dying and it had nothing to do with their own stupidity. Sometimes it has to do with their bravery, like the medical people um, who are helping others and they get ill and I can't save them. I cannot mm -hmm. save them. That's not my job. You know, I said in a couple of cases, I have held back because I could see their future was going to, that's usually in suicide, and delaying uh, death sometimes, but not with this, not with this. Well, I think this whole uh, pandemic is giving us plenty of reasons to drink, wouldn't you say, Deb? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. So I do your... have, I do have my glass of wine every night, <laughs> wherever I am. Chocolate wine? 
chocolate wine yes yes so are you drinking a kamikaze today or are you on the wine? yeah oh no 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 in my fancy glass i have a cl uh, fancy glass i got it it says hollywood on it and mm -hmm. it says beverly hills and um rodeo drive oh i've seen rodeo drive not for a bargain shopper however but um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I will. I will have a sip of my uh, kamikaze right now, dear. Are we okay, almost I'll, finished? I'll take a sip with you. Oh, well, I, I was skull. hoping though that your skull salute, the Heim, mm -hmm. the Strovia. Uh prost. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you were going to have a joke for me. Oh, I, I do. I have another joke. Um, uh, let me think, let me think. Okay, okay, here it is. There were three men, a Frenchman, an Italian, and a Jewish man who were all held captive. And uh, the people who um, were holding them were going to execute all three of the men. And they said, but you, you are entitled to uh, a last meal. So they went to the Frenchman and he said, I'm not very good at dialects, but he said, I would like some very good French wine, uh, some fromage cheese, and good French bread. So they gave it to him, and then they executed him. So they went to the Italian man, and they said, all right, what do you want? And he said, I want a, just a bigger bowl of pasta. They <laughs> gave him his big bowl of pasta, and... He ate it, enjoyed it, and then they executed him. And now, now it was he didn't the Jewish eat that pasta without bread. You can't tell me he ate that without bread. I'm sorry. I'll <laughs> throw that in. He uh, <laughs> a pasta and bread he had, and he should have had wine too. Italian wine is excellent, but he didn't ask for it. All right. So now it's the Jewish man's turn, and they go to him. And what do you want? Listen. All I want is a big bowl of strawberries. And they looked at them, all of them, and said, strawberries, strawberries aren't even in season. And he said, so I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> well, it was another enjoyable uh, drink with you. And I think I could probably sit here all night and chat with you. But I, sure I enjoy it. Well, thank you so much. It is my and extreme pleasure. And I appreciate this is very good work, important work that you're doing. And am, I am your guest anytime you ask. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And I'll see you next time for drinks. Uh, you surely will. Bye-bye. Bye. And with that, thank you for listening. Please stay tuned for future episodes of Everyone Dies. Our thanks to our executive producer, retired Major General David, our producer Sandy, John, our technical advisor, Molly, our Twitter correspondent, and our friends, family, and our loyal listeners who are supporting our work at Everyone Dies. This is Charlie Navarrete. And I'm Marianne Manso. And we look forward to talking with you again soon. Remember every day. This podcast does not provide medical advice. All discussion on this podcast, such as treatments, dosages, outcomes, charts, patient profiles, advice, messages, and any other discussion are for informational purposes only and are not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Always seek the advice of your primary care practitioner or other qualified health providers with any questions that you may have regarding your health. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard from this podcast. If you think you may have a medical emergency, call your doctor or 911 immediately. Everyone Dies does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, practitioners, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned in this podcast. Reliance on any information provided in this podcast by persons appearing on this podcast at the invitation of Everyone Dies or by other members is solely at your own risk.